we believe in a personal, articulate God, not just a higher power, not just a set of natural laws. God is a personal He, not an impersonal it. And the beauty in creation actually reveals God's loving character. Welcome to the Calvary Podcast. For more information about a Calvary campus near you or to join us online, visit our website, calvarycc.global. Well, today we're starting in our church a new series, which we're calling The Faith. Uh, Eight sermons over four Sundays. We're going to be talking about what Christians believe and why it matters. Just hit the person next to you and say, I'm glad you're in church today. Everyone else is going to be playing catch up, but you're in church this morning. Eight sermons, four Sundays, what Christians believe and why it actually matters. Let me start with a thought exercise to uh, help us to understand the why behind this series. Um, imagine with me for a moment that, that you and I meet for the first time. Uh, maybe we meet for the first time in a cafe or at a shopping centre or maybe at an airport. We run into each other and we get chatting and w- we've not met each other. But after a couple of minutes of chatting, you I arrive at the idea that, that you actually know my wife, Sarah. You say, no, no, hang on. I'm, I'm, I'm connecting the dots here. I know we've just met, but I'm sure I know your wife, Sarah. And, uh, and, 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 you know, I say, are you sure you know Sarah? Like we've only just met. And you say, yeah, absolutely. I know Sarah Bell. In fact, I met her about two years ago. Sarah is six, uh, six feet tall, brown hair, big sports fan, loves rap music. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know Sarah. Now, the people laughing in church today are the ones who know my wife, Sarah, because she is not six foot tall and doesn't like rap music and doesn't have brown hair. But, but you're convinced. You, no, no, no. I, I definitely know Sarah. Or well, who knows at that point in the conversation, I interrupt and I say, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, you, you, you must be talking about a different Sarah. You see, um, my wife, Sarah, she's about five foot tall, blonde hair, doesn't care for sport and hates rap music. And, and so we, we must be talking about a different Sarah. Well, at that point, in my mind, it's time for the conversation to move on to a new topic. But, but suppose, if you will, that, that you refuse to back down. And you say, no, that's not how I see Sarah Bell. I think she's six foot tall. And I think she's got brown hair. And I think she's a huge sports fan. And she loves Tupac. Oh, and, and I just can't accept the idea that Sarah would be any different. Well, who knows now it's getting really awkward because now I'm not quite sure what to do, because we're talking about Sarah Bell, and Sarah Bell is a real person. She's my wife. We're, we're talking about a real person with particular and definable traits, and just because you're sincere, and just because you're passionate about what you believe, it doesn't mean that you're right. You could be sincerely mistaken. In fact, you don't just get to make up your own ideas about what Sarah Bell is like and who Sarah Bell is. Sarah Bell is not whoever you imagine her to be. Sarah Bell is Sarah Bell. Does this make sense today? Now, if it's true that you and I don't have the right to simply make up or decide the attributes of another person, wouldn't it also be true that you and I don't have the right to simply make up or decide for ourselves what God is like and what constitutes the Christian faith? You know, in our day and age in 2023, this actually comes as a shock to many people. The idea that Christian faith, that the Christian faith has certain and definable beliefs that it is some things and it isn't other things, this comes as a shock to many people in 2023 because who knows, in our day and age, we have become accustomed to the idea that you and I can personalise and customise almost anything that we want. We think that because we can personalise our phone lock screen and desktop pattern, we think that we can personalise our lattes, I'll have decaf with half a shot, and uh, we think because we can personalise our phones and our lattes, and our sneakers. We think that because we can choose our own gender, we think that because we can, you know, adjust global weather patterns by drinking from a paper straw, we think that... (laughs) We think that nothing is beyond our reach. Nothing cannot be changed by us. And that's why we're living in a time where people tend to say things like, well, I just believe that God is like such and such. Anyone ever heard someone say that? Well, I just believe God is like such and such. Or, well, well, I could never imagine a God 
who is like, da, 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 da. Uh, well, well, I think the Christian faith is really about, insert own preferences here. And, and when people say that in today's day and age, the implicit assumption is that because they think it, well, that settles it. Well, because they think it, it must be true. But, but here's the reality. Just because God is personal doesn't mean that you and I get to personalize God. And just because I think something about God doesn't mean that my thoughts are necessarily true. And it doesn't mean that I can call my thoughts Christianity any more than you can call that six foot tall rap loving sports fan, my wife. You don't just get to make up who God is. You don't just get to make up and stylize your own version of what the Christian faith is. The reality is there are core beliefs that have actually united Christians for the last 2000 years. Do you catch what I'm saying today? In Jude uh, verse 3, Jude didn't get any chapters, he just got verses. In Jude verse 3, he calls it the faith. Everyone say the faith. Not my faith, not a faith. He calls it the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's people. And, And in an age where many people assume that Christianity can be whatever I want it to be, Who knows, it's incumbent upon us to actually know the central truths of the faith that we profess. Who knows, it's very hard to live out a faith that you don't know. It's very hard to defend a Christianity that you can't explain. And in an age of relevance, uh, or relativism, sorry, who knows, now more than ever, the church needs to know not just how to spell Jesus, but needs to know how to articulate a Christian worldview in the midst of a world that has gone bonkers. So, so to personalize the doctrines of the faith is, is kind of one error. Another error that I've observed is to so generalize Christianity that it becomes so watered down that it loses any point of distinction. Uh, by this I mean when, when people say things like this, well, you know, the essence of Christianity is that we just need to love one another. Well, Christianity is really just about being kind. Well, Christianity is really just about care for neighbor. And who knows, all of these are good things. I'm not advocating that we should hate one another or be rude or not care for our neighbor. All of these are good things, but who knows, loving one another, being kind and caring for your neighbor, they're all good things. But who knows, if that's your definition of Christianity, you can do all of that without Jesus. And and my fear is that the church, particularly in the West in 2023, is watering down the articles of our faith to the point that it becomes indistinguishable from any other religion or philosophy. It becomes something so watered down, it hardly even tastes like Christianity anymore. Um, Rob Dreyer, in his book, The Benedict Option, uh, he reports that even among people who describe themselves as Christians, there's an astonishing ignorance among Christians as to what Christians actually believe. Uh, Dreyer uh, looked at studies and surveys conducted in America, and uh, he found that the religion of young American nominal Christians is at best what he describes as moralistic, therapeutic deism. Everyone's wondering, what on earth does that mean? Uh, I'm not sure, so I'm just going to... Moralistic, therapeutic deism. You know, Um, it it kind of goes like this. Moralistic theopudic deism kind of goes like this. Well, well, I believe that there is a God. That's deism. And and that God, well, he exists to, you know, solve my problems and make me feel better about life. Therapeutic. And, uh, And basically, you should just be nice to people. Moralistic. And so in practice, moralistic therapeutic deism, which is fast becoming the Christianity of the West, sounds a little bit like this. Well, I believe in God and, you know, I pray to him when life's difficult and my kids are acting up and I need them to behave a bit more and things aren't going my way and I need a bit of favour in my finance and basically I'm a pretty good person. And so, you know, we we imagine that that kind of is Christianity, right? Well, I believe in God. By the way, whenever someone ever says, I believe in God too, never just go, oh, that's good. Would we believe the same? Always ask with another question. What's he like? 
Because when I say I believe in God, that can mean any number of things. And so moralistic therapeutic deism imagines that God is some kind of, you know, non-confrontational therapist who solves my problems, repeats my thoughts back to me, and is always there to remind me that I am in fact a very, very special person who ought to be celebrated. It's so general that it's a Christianity without Christ, it's a Christianity without a cross, it's a Christianity without confession, and it's a Christianity without the creeds. And I think that's why we like it, because it doesn't offend me and it doesn't offend anybody else. But who knows, true Christian faith is not a vague sentimentality. True Christian faith it is not just a projection of my own personal preferences. Rather, the Christian faith is actually a set of truth claims about the existence and the nature of God and His action in human history. Now, I'm going after this this morning. You see, to be a Christian is not just, just to believe in Jesus. Ever seen those people, they accept their Oscar awards and they've just, you know, released a movie that's full of cussing and inappropriate sex scenes and they say, oh, I just want to thank Jesus ever seen that? And you're like, are we worshipping the same Jesus? Because to be a Christian is not just to believe in Jesus, it's to believe right and true things about Jesus. And, and there are beliefs that have united Christians everywhere and always for the last few thousand years. That, and whether those people be Catholics, Anglicans, Baptists, Protestants, Pentecostals, Eastern, Eastern Orthodox believers, all of those denominations can point to an ancient document known as the Apostles' Creed as a summation of the Christian faith. Now, the Apostles' Creed is not found in the Bible. Rather, it's a summary of the central truths in the Bible. You could say it this way, that what the Bible says at length, the Apostles' Creed says in brief. And uh, some of us will be familiar with it. Others of us have never heard of it. And so I want to read it out for us today. In Emerald, I hope you're paying attention online here on the Sunshine Coast. Let's read it. It's going to be on the screen. Let's read it. It says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, I believe that Christianity is just about kindness. Who knows, there's a lot more to it than that. There are some central tenets of the Christian faith that have united believers in every nation, uh, in every age, as to the essence of the Christian faith. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take four Sundays to walk through the Apostles' Creed and why it matters in our lives. Now, I know that some of us are like so excited for this series. We're like, come on, come on. And we, in fact, some of us are like, fuck. others of us are like, oh my goodness, do we really need to worry about creeds and doctrines? Aren't they just dry and irrelevant? Well, let me say this. It's hard to be a Christian if you can't define Christianity. Creeds actually help us to know the essentials of the faith. Creeds help us to define truth and correct error. Creeds help us to worship and confess the faith. Creeds actually connect us to the faith of our fathers and creeds define true Christian unity. The reality is when we see clearly who God is and what God has done, it's only then that we start to see clearly who we are and what we ought to do. And so, uh, A.W. Tozer, he said it this way. He said, what we believe about God is the most important thing about us. And so over four Sundays, my prayer is that we're going to see how these ancient statements of belief actually still speak to the deepest questions of our heart today. And that as we focus on the Lord, who He is and how He acts, that faith would spring up in our hearts as a result. So are you ready? Here we go. That was just the preamble. Message one. Let's read the opening sentence of the creed. It says this, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. You know, the Apostles' Creed begins where the Bible begins. 
And, and so let's go there. Genesis chapter one, verse one, first verse of the Bible says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, you only need to get a sentence into the Bible and there are enormous implications for what we've just read. You see, Christianity begins with the affirmation that God is. Some of you are like, God is what? No, no, just just God is. Just let that sink in for a moment. God is. What I mean by that is that there, there, will, there has never been a moment when God was. And there will never be a moment where God will be. God just is. I hope you've had a coffee today. God is. Whether I feel him or not, God is. Whether I acknowledge him or not, God is. Whether I vote for him or not, God is. Whether I come to church or not, by the way, you should still come to church. God is. Whether I worship him or not, God is. You see, the Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Thomas Aquinas said it this way, among all the truths which the faithful must believe, this is the first that there is one God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Now this opening sentence of the creed makes three particular claims about God. And I wanna focus on them in the time that we've got left today. Because my fear is sometimes we come to church and we talk a lot about how to improve your life, but not enough about God. But who knows, if we are going to withstand secular culture and be a prevailing church, we need more than TED Talks on a Sunday that teach you how to have a slightly better version of yourself. The church has to know and be able to articulate who God is, what He's like, so that we, here's another one of my theories. Because the church has preached less and less theology, we've got more and more therapists. Anyway, that's just a little side thought. Three particular claims. Here's the first. Number one, God is almighty. Not in a Bruce Almighty kind of way. God is almighty. What does that mean? Well, from this opening verse or the opening verses of the Bible, there's at least four things we can conclude here. And I want you to take notes. Number one is this, God is self-existent. God is self-existent. You know, before there was a where or a what or a when, there was God. Behind all matter, behind all life, behind all space, behind all laws and behind all time, there is God. Every cause, uh, sorry, every effect has a cause except God. God is the first cause from which all life flows. Who knows, that alone is why God is very different to you and I. You and I, we derive our life from our biological parents. Let's not meditate upon that too long, but, but we derive our life from our biological parents, but God's existence is underived. Uh, Jesus said in John 5 and verse 26, the Father has life in Himself. Psalm 90 verse two says it this way, before the mountains were brought forth or or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God is self-existent. Number two, God is self-sufficient. This is where it gets confronting. God is self-sufficient. You see, while all of creation is desperately dependent upon God, God is quite fine without us. Isn't that a sobering thought? We desperately need God. In Him, we live and move and have our being. At any moment, God could ask for His breath back and I would be in trouble. We are desperately dependent upon God, but God was doing quite fine before we came along. God will be doing quite fine long after we leave. God is self-sufficient. You could say it this way, God is independent. He has no need. He has no lack. God has no want. Acts 17 verse 24, Paul preaching into a pagan audience on Mars Hill in Athens said this, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, doesn't live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath. And if life and breath isn't enough, everything, it all comes from him. Who knows that that oftentimes we love to talk about serving God. 
Anyone ever, you know, what do you want to do with your future? Oh, I just want to serve God. Oh, I'm committed to serving God. And I understand the, the, the intent behind that statement, but who knows the reality is God can't be served. God has no need. Uh, God loves us and God includes us, but, but God really doesn't need Dustin Bell. Much to the hurt of Dustin Bell's ego. God doesn't need me. There's literally nothing that Dustin Bell could do that would be to God's advantage. There, there is nothing that I could do. There is nothing that I could offer God to which he would reply, oh, thanks, Dustin, I needed that. He's God all by himself. Who knows, when I serve, it doesn't fill some lack in him. When I tithe, it doesn't make up for some deficit in his budget. When I worship, it doesn't prop up his flailing sense of self-esteem. Oh, I can't wait till Sunday. Church, sing it again, sing it again. When I deny God's existence, it doesn't make him any less God. Who knows, all 8 billion people on the planet could read Richard Dawkins' God delusion and become avowed atheists, and that wouldn't change God one bit any more than the whole planet yelling darkness would stop the sun from shining. God is God. God is self-sufficient. There is no gain for God in having me. There is no gain for God in loving me. There is no gain for God in including me. All of this is quite sobering, really, isn't it? And I don't say this to, to try to push anybody into the ground, but when we understand this, it makes the love of God all the more amazing. That, that Christ loved us and gave himself for us, not to make up for some lack in himself, but, but out of a completely self, this is why you can trust the love of God. You can trust the love of God because God needs nothing. Ever had someone, they're really nice to you, then you find out there's a catch. They actually needed something from you. And, and you realise that whole time they were loving me and being kind to me, but it's because they needed something from me. Who knows, when God says, I love you, it's the most pure form of love because he needs nothing from us. God is self-sufficient. Number three is this, God is personal. Genesis 1 verse 3 says, And God said, let there be light. And there was light. The Bible says that God said. You might say, well, so what? Who cares that God said? Of course God said. No, no, no. That, that means something. Speech flows from personality. Who knows? A force or a power or an energy doesn't speak. If it does, you had too many mushrooms on your pizza last night. <laughs> Nature alone doesn't speak, doesn't have a voice. Speech flows from personality, which means this, Christianity rejects the idea that God is just some higher power. Your colleague at work says, oh, I believe in a higher power. We kind of believe the same thing. No, it's very different. We believe in a personal, articulate God, not just a higher power, not just a set of natural laws. God is a personal he, not an impersonal it. And the beauty in creation actually reveals God's loving character. That's why Christianity rejects naturalism and says, well, all that there is is natural forces. No, 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 we believe that there is a personal, articulate God behind it all. That's why Christianity rejects deism, this idea that God kind of wound up creation and then walked away and is not interested. No, 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 we reject that because God is a personal, articulate, God. Number four is this, God is omnipotent. God has complete power. One of the names for God in the Old Testament is the name El Shaddai. Everyone say El Shaddai. El Shaddai literally means God Almighty. As I said earlier, these days, people like to talk much more about God as if he is a type of emasculated being. He's a God who only consists of love and kindness, but who knows, the Lord does not change. Today, he is still the almighty God who can turn the heart of kings and he can direct nations to do his will. When we get a glimpse into heaven in Revelation chapter four, verse eight, the angels and the elders are worshiping God and they are not saying kindness, 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 love, 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 mercy, mercy, mercy. No, no, no. They are saying holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. Who knows? He was almighty in the act of creation. He was almighty when he parted the seas. He was almighty in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He was almighty in a dark, dead tomb. He is almighty in the church today. He is an almighty God. Who knows, that's why we ought come to God with an appropriate amount of fear and awe. 
You know, sometimes I, I have to, you know, catch myself in church because, you know, I walk into church, uh, you know, 18 minutes late and I rock up with my latte and it's like, holy, holy, holy. And, and we act like Jesus is my BFF or Jesus is my homeboy or God is kind of just like my life coach or my therapist. No, he is an almighty God. And so there ought to be an appropriate fear and awe when we come to think about God. But who knows, at the same time, there ought to be a faith and a confidence that comes with it. Because if God is almighty, then that means that what is impossible for me is possible for Him. Listen, you should never stop praying the prayer of faith. You should never stop believing God for miracles. You should never stop believing that God is able to make a way. Why? Because He is not just a God who has a few nice ideas about how to improve our lives. He is an almighty God. God, the maker of heavens and earth. So, so firstly, we understand that God is almighty. Second thing we understand is that God is the maker of heaven and earth. This is the easiest sermon to write ever. <laughs> He's the maker of heaven and earth. You know, it's popular today to believe that you and I live in a godless cosmos, that the world is without a maker, that, that all that is in the universe, everything that we see, including ourselves, are just the result of blind, dumb, random, futile, natural forces. You know, the universe simply is. It's a pointless happenstance. You know, by the way, notice that you either believe that God is or the universe is. Either way, you're putting your faith in something or someone being eternal. So never believe the idea that you as a Christian are a person of faith, but those non-Christians aren't people of faith. No, 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 they've just got faith in an infinite universe. We have faith in an infinite God. We're all hedging our bets on, on faith here. And, and so, so the Bible is very clear that, that behind everything that we see, behind who you and I are, God is the maker of heaven and earth. Sir Isaac Newton designed a scale model of a solar system. And then he had a craftsman build the model solar system from his plans and uh, put it up in his house. And in the center of this model solar system, there was a large ball made of brass representing the sun. And then revolving around the sun, there were smaller balls attached to spokes of different lengths. And every one of those balls represented the planets and the spokes placed them at the appropriate distances from the sun. And uh, all of the planets were, were created and put in their proper order. But on top of that, all of the balls were geared together so that when Sir Isaac Newton turned a crank at the front, they all moved in orbits around the sun. It was a serious model that he set up in his house. One day, his scientist friend came to visit while Isaac Newton was reading in his study. His friend walked in and saw the model and he recognised what it was. His friend started to crank the model and he watched as it moved in perfect order and symmetry. And uh, he said to Isaac Newton, man, this is tremendous. Who made it? Well, Newton didn't even look up from his book. He goes, nobody. His friend turned to him with a confused look and said, don't be stupid. Who made the model of the planets that you put up in your lounge room? And Newton looked up him with a straight face and said, nobody made it. Those balls just happened and put themselves in order. Well, his friend was now ticked off and said, what do you think, I'm some kind of fool? Of course somebody made this. Who's the craftsman? He's a genius, I wanna meet him. He put his book down, walked across the room and looked at the model with his friend and he said, listen, this is just a poor imitation of the universe. I can't convince you that this model, this toy doesn't have a designer or a maker. And yet you tell me that the solar system that this model represents doesn't have a maker? You gotta tell me, is that the logical conclusion of a scientist? And Newton's friend actually recognized his own inconsistency and in the following months actually came to faith in a maker God. Who knows, books don't write themselves. They need an author. Cars don't build themselves. They need a manufacturer. Music doesn't compose itself. It needs a composer. And the heavens and the earth don't make themselves. They need a maker. And you might say, well, well so what? Why does that matter? How does that make a difference as I drive home this afternoon? Well, think about it. If there's no God and our lives are just the result of blind, dumb forces, then that would mean this, that you and I have come from nothing. And in the end, you and I are going to nothing. And all of our lives in the in-between are a meaningless nothing. 
Sure, we eat and drink and make love and entertain ourselves for a few years, but, but ultimately it's all meaningless. There's, there's no reason for existing. There's no reason to be a virtuous or a good person. Whether or not we are good or bad, selfless or selfish, self-controlled or self-indulgent, it all came from nothing and it's all gonna end up as nothing. And so all of life becomes futile. Anyone feeling encouraged today? But who knows if God is our maker? Can you see how Genesis, we're, we're, we're one verse into the Bible and the implications are staggering. If God is our maker, if God is the author, if God is the composer, then that would mean that our lives are actually infused with meaning. That would mean that there is a greater story at play. That would mean that there is, a, there is actually a greater melody to which our lives ought be in harmony. And so you can see here in the creeds, here in the first verse of the Bible, we actually meet the gospel for the first time because the God who made the heavens and the earth, He made you. Just hit the person next to you and say, you're the work of God. The God who made the heavens and is the God who made you, which means this church, your life is not an inconsequential accident. It doesn't matter what the circumstances were surrounding your arrival into this planet. I wanna tell you that your life is not inconsequential. Your life is not accidental. Your life is not without purpose. If God is the maker of heaven and earth, and if God made me, then that means that you and I have a welcome place in creation. It means that you and I have intrinsic value because we bear the signature of the creator in ourselves. Who knows that is good news. Charles Colson said this, if there is a personal creator, if God is, then his creation can reflect his character. It can reveal God's purposes for us. Our lives instantly gain meaning. The world actually becomes a place of knowing God as well as our dwelling place. We can truly be the reasoning, imaginative, creative persons we believe ourselves to be. How many people are being helped today? You know, in addition to finding meaning and value, if God is the maker of heaven and earth, we also meet another sobering reality. If God is the maker, then that gives God authority over all that he has made. I mean, by virtue of creation, God is king over everything. There is, there is God and then there is everything that is not God, which means that God is actually king and sovereign over everything that he has made, which means that God actually rules over Satan and demons. God is the king over planets, stars, moons, animals, planets, mankind, me. That means that everything comes from God, belongs to God and exists for God. And yet this is something that I think we love to forget because how often we perceive persuade ourselves that things belong to us, don't we? We say things like, it's my time, my body, my future, my job, my car, my home, my family, my money. And it must bring a smirk to God's face because actually by virtue of creation, it all belongs to Him. Abraham Kuyper said this, there is not a square inch of the entire domain of human life of which Christ the sovereign does not say mine. You know, some people might look at your Christian faith and say things like, man, you're pretty serious about this whole Christianity thing, aren't you? Like, you're pretty radical. Like, you really believe this stuff. Like, man, you're pretty committed to that church. Like, you go at least like twice a month. And, and you, like, you give money and stuff. Like, and you, you're, like, you're pretty serious about this. Well, who knows? It's impossible to affirm in one breath that he is the maker of heaven and earth, but then in the next breath be nominal and not that interested about our faith. If it's true that he is the maker of heaven and earth, then it follows that the most rational, logical response for a created being is to offer up all of my life as an offering before him to bring him glory. Who knows, you cannot consider the doctrine of God being the maker of heaven and earth and come away living a lukewarm, half-hearted, pale Christian life. Do you catch what I'm saying today? If it's true, then it all belongs to God, including me. So first, God is almighty. Second, God is the maker of heaven and earth. Third, and finally, God is our Father. You know, it states, I believe in God, the Father, almighty. So later on in this series, we'll, we'll talk about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Christian picture of a triune God. And, uh, and yet it starts with this truth revealed that God is a Father Almighty. You know, if that be true, then that would mean that God is 
infinitely powerful. He's almighty. But in the next breath, God is intensely personal. He's our Father. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Who knows, if God was only a creator, if He was a creator alone, that then you and I might revere Him, we might respect Him, but there might be room for you and I to doubt whether He really cares for us, whether He's really interested in us, whether He really inclines and listens to our prayer. If He was only the Almighty, it would produce awe and fear and reverence in me, but not a lot else. But if it's true that God is Almighty Father, then it's true that God is not just infinitely powerful, but God is also intensely powerful personal. The Bible wants us to see that there is a tenderness about God. There's a gentleness about God. There's an awareness of God. God loves us and He seeks our good. You know, some of us have have got no problem picturing a God who is awesome and and creator. And uh, for, for those of us who have got no problem picturing God like that, then God today by His Spirit wants to help you to see an emerald here in Budrum online. He wants you to see that He's also personal. He knows your name. He knows your hopes. He knows your dreams. He knows your anxieties. He knows your fears. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows that some of them are changing colour at a rapid rate. He, he knows everything about you and I. He's not just almighty. He's, he's a father. Some of us have got no problem picturing God as a father. but but it maybe can slip into a reverence. And today there needs to become a deeper sense of He's not just a Father, but He's also Almighty and He's worthy of honour and respect. And all of my life, He he holds intention for all time and in all ages and for all peoples, this balance of being the Almighty Father. Let me me close with this. Um, Like like all of us uh, over the last seven days, I've been watching news feeds and social media reels about what's taking place in, in Gaza and in Israel. And, uh, you know, it's, it's impossible uh, not to be heavy-hearted about, about what we're seeing take place. Though yesterday, I, I, I saw one story of hope. And uh, I, I don't share this to in any way glorify war or make light of the situation. It's just one story of hope that caught my attention yesterday because uh, it's the story of, of events that took place last Saturday when uh, Hamas gunmen, they, they came to enact uh, their terror and to murder. And uh, there was a 22-year-old girl and her boyfriend. Her name was uh, Nita Portel. And uh, she was in a house as gunmen came. And she, she didn't know what to do. What do you do in that situation? And so she grabbed her phone and she texted her dad. She hadn't talked to her dad for six years. She hadn't talked to her dad since her mum and dad divorced when she was a teenager. No talk, no text messages, no contact. Hadn't seen her dad for six years. But in this moment last Saturday, she panicked and she sent a three-word text to her dad and just said, they are close. Straight away, she got a message back from her dad saying, lock the doors A few minutes later, there was another text from her saying, they shot me, help. And then straight away, there was a text back saying, I'm coming. No contact for six years. True story. I think there's a photo that'll be on the screen. Dad, who's a policeman, drives into a hostile war zone in an unmarked car, uh, takes bullet fire himself and and scours through the debris in order to find his daughter. And uh, then he ended up finding her, grabbed his daughter, her partner, got them in the car, got them out of the war zone. She's still alive today, got her to hospital and she lives to tell the story. (laughs) Again, let me say, um, let me be really clear. I'm not trying to make light of what has happened. I'm just saying there's a story of hope in here. And as I read this story, I thought, isn't it amazing that no matter how much time passed, time didn't change the fact that he was her father. No matter what crisis came, the crisis didn't change the fact that he was still her father. No matter what distance there had been, the distance hadn't changed the fact that he was still her father. And yet sometimes we can imagine that circumstances that we go through somehow change who he is. That our own actions, our own quietness, our own distance, our own coldness can somehow change the nature of our father. But I wanna tell you, Time doesn't change him. Distance doesn't change him. Crisis doesn't change him. He is an almighty father. It's who he was, it's who he is, and it's who he always will be. Can you say amen today? 
And I just believe there'll be people today, maybe in Emerald, maybe here on the Sunshine Coast, maybe online. And maybe it's been a long time since you prayed. Maybe it's been a long time since you found yourself in church. Maybe you say, you know what? I know that there's stuff in my life that probably isn't pleasing to God. Can I just say that who you are and where you are doesn't change who He is. But I don't feel like He's my Father in heaven. Our feelings actually don't change things. Well, that's not how I imagine Him to be. (laughs) Well, our imaginations don't dictate who He is. He is an almighty Father. For more information about a Calvary campus near you or to join us online, visit our website, calvarycc.global.